I'm a, I'm a, I'm a U.S. Army veteran, um, and I, I served uh, 20 years in the U.S. Army, and um, I got the got the itch to get into the entertainment business. Actually, believe it or not, while I was deployed to um, Iraq, and a gentleman um, that was bringing some entertainment over to entertain the troops. Um, we we spoke about it. He was a, a retired uh, um, service member as well at the time, and he uh, and he just talked to me a little bit about it. I started picking his brain, and the rest is kind of history. I got back home, and I just started researching, and just I'm I'm the type of guy that I'm either all in or all out. So I decided to get all in right away, and here we are. So what were the first uh, first events that you did and how you first got started? Who was maybe a mentor and, and in those beginning days? So what's crazy is that I really didn't have a mentor uh, when I got into it. And 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 that's crazy. I would I would advise not doing it the way I did it <laughs> um, because I, I made a lot of mistakes. Um I got involved with somebody who I thought kind of knew what they were doing, but in actuality, really didn't. But it, but anyway, um, it kind of gave me the confidence to go ahead and and, and try it. Um, so I really didn't get mentors, honestly, until after I was probably about a year into it. Um, but the, the, to answer the, the the second part of that question. Um, Again, I'm either all in or all out. So I went all in full steam ahead on my very first show. So a lot of promoters, they'll typically start out with doing some smaller budget shows initially and work their way up to some larger budget shows. I just did the total opposite. Um, I uh, I did my first show was, was Frankie Beverly. <laughs> Made featuring Frankie Beverly. That was my dad's favorite R&B group of all time. And so I did that show uh, down in Macon, Georgia, and I actually it was a success. Um, but that was probably the worst thing that could have happened to me by me becoming being successful the first show, because what I learned through that experience is that with success you really don't learn anything. You feel like you've done everything right. Okay. So. Um... How do you go about choosing your artists for your concert? So the, in relation to your, you not only have uh, performances and concerts here at our venue, but at other venues across the country. How do you determine where you're going to put the artist and and how who you're going to book? So as it relates to, um, you know, my primary base obviously is Metro Atlanta. Um, been doing summer concert series. Um, in Atlanta for probably about nine years now. Uh, but so Atlanta is a market that really can spoil you um, as a promoter because it's a great market for the uh, for the urban audience and I'm sure for the uh, for the, the the mainstream audience as well. Um, but in terms of selecting artists, other places and other markets, it really varies market by market. Uh, one of the things that I learned is that just because an artist may be successful in one market don't necessarily mean they're successful in another market. Um, markets across the country are as different as, you know, states when it comes to the Electoral College. <laughs> I mean, it's just very, very different. And um, so, those are some of the things that I really use with, uh, well, that's one of the key things I really use when it comes to selecting artists. And the other thing is just that you know, at the end of the day, this is a business for me. And, you know, it, with selecting artists, it has to make sense. A lot of the time, people want to see, you know, they want to see certain artists or they have suggestions about seeing certain artists, but they don't understand the business behind behind this. And so, you know, it it, it can, you know, be frustrating at times. So for me, um, the numbers have to make sense when it comes to certain artists, the venue size for that particular artist, et cetera. Okay. Um, who are some of your mentors or inspirations in the business? Um, on the promoter side, 
Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy by the name of Brian Alden, who is uh, he is um, the owner and CEO of North American Entertainment Group. He uh, he's the third largest um, urban promoter in the country behind Live Nation and AEG. Um, he is the only independent promoter out of those three um, companies. Um, and he probably does in the neighborhood of 200 to 250 events a year now. Um, but um, he's somebody that I lean on quite a bit that I actually partner with when I do stuff throughout the country and um, has probably about 35 or so years of experience that you know I pick his brain quite a bit. Um, as it relates to just individuals in the entertainment industry, um, Keith Sweat is a dear friend of mine. Uh, you know, I respect Keith um, because he's been able to maintain a certain status in this business um, for over 30 years, uh, which is really hard to do, especially for urban artists. Um, he has a syndicated radio show um, that's probably syndicated in 70 markets, you know, um, throughout the country. And he's just, an, he's a brilliant businessman. You know, he he was somebody, he's somebody that I really respect. Uh, we talk about everything that has to do with the entertainment industry and things that have nothing to do with the entertainment industry. Um, because he was, a, he, he worked on Wall Street prior to getting into the entertainment business. So I pick his brain about a lot of stuff. So, yeah. Excellent. All right. So what what is it about the Mabel House Barnes Amphitheater specifically that that you like and what drew you here to do concerts in our venue? So, you know, I had been hearing a little bit about Mabel House uh, when I was doing my summer concert series at another venue uh, in the city of Atlanta. And um, it wasn't until uh, I was asked to um, I was asked to uh, uh, produce, I guess you would call it, um, uh, the annual fundraising event that the Family Health Centers of Georgia does uh, every year. And I think that was the first year they decided to do it at Mabel House. And once I got there, on the day of that show, um, I fell in love with the venue. I fell in love with the venue. I, I saw the potential that the venue uh, had. Um, I think it was just untapped. Um, in terms of the urban audience, for the most part, um, other than the jazz genre, I know that you know Steve Ewing had been doing some stuff out there for years. But uh, so, I just fell in love with the venue. Um, what keeps me there now uh, is it's a pleasure working with you two. Um, it's always good to to have people at the venue that that are a pleasure to work with and that really are there to service the customers and their clients. Um, you know, I, 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 I love the community of Mableton. Um, when I, and, and one thing about concerts and, and, and just live events, period, that people really don't understand is that they have a significant imp economic impact on the local community. Um, for instance, when you allow people to bring in their own food and drinks and that type of thing, uh, you go down the street to the local grocery store right before a show and you'd be surprised at how many people that are in that grocery store that are getting ready to come to that concert that are that are stocking up to come to that concert um you'd be surprised at the people that stop at restaurants in that local community prior to coming to a concert to get something to eat etc so um the community itself is welcoming um you know it's a Cobb county operated venue which you know again lends itself to a lot of different assets and you know i just i've always had a great experience always had a great experience never a bad experience well we love to hear that because we we definitely love having you in our venue what what do you envision in the, for the future at, at the mabel house of you know what events maybe that you're not doing now you look at in the future i know it's been kind of tough with COVID 19 we pushed most of everything well everything we were doing from 2020 to 2021, but what do you what do you see in the future for the for us and, and your concerts? You know, I just want to continue to bring new exciting artists that the public want to see. Um, 
you know, I, 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 I've been toying with the idea of doing some, some theater out there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I've been toying with the idea of doing, uh, of some type of multiple stage festival events out there. So, you know, I've been been kind of torn with several different I think ideas. I you know, I just we just have to sit down and make it work logistically. But um, you know, again, I think Mabel House um is a great venue that I love being at and I think has a significant amount of upside and potential. Okay. Um if you were going to give some advice to some up and coming promoters or, or individuals that want to get into the promotion business, what, what would you recommend to them? To really just do their homework, do what I did not do. Um, get you a mentor, um, really try to learn as much about the business as you possibly can. Um, you know, kind of study your craft and study what you really are trying to get into because, you know, a lot of people, try to get into this and one event puts them out of business sometimes. So um, it can be an extremely rewarding business, but it can also be a big failure. Um, and only about 75% of that you really have control over um, because <laughs> you really don't have control over anybody wanting to buy a ticket for an event that you, you know, are, are uh, producing or promoting. So um, speak to that just for just a second, because a lot of people think that concert promoters are making millions and millions of dollars off of these shows, but the margins are really kind of tight. Can you speak to that just a little bit, just to, to give our audience just a little bit of background about what the business is really like? Yeah, you know, so uh, that kind of goes back to uh, the, the question of the artists and that type of thing. Um, you have to do what makes sense financially. Um, you know, obviously there are a lot of artists that um, I want to bring to certain places, but, you know, based upon venue capacity, et cetera, you just can't. So you first you have to have the business part of everything um, right. Um, but yeah, the, the profit margins um, in the, you know, promotions world um, can be very, you know, lucrative, but at the same time, uh, for the most part, you know, if you get a 20 to 25% return on your investment, you're doing very, very well. Um, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it can be a tough business sometimes. Um, luckily, again, for, for me, um, I've been blessed to be in a market like Atlanta um, that people really come out and love live entertainment. And, um, and you know, it's just, it's just a great, great Southern city that allows for people to really come out. Um, they enjoy the outdoors um, and just come out and have a good time. So, um, but yeah, it, it, you know, the profit margins are very, very low at times, depending upon the business and depending upon the, the artists and the price you get the artists at, et cetera. All right. Uh, so, so Jeremy, so what what do you want to maybe let our uh, audience ask? What do you do in your free time? What what do you like to do besides for promote concerts? Um, you know, travel a little bit. I'm a beach guy. Um, so that that's pretty much it right now, Robbie. Um, uh, you know, what's crazy is that for me, this is a year round thing. Um, at Mabel House, we do uh, a summer concert series that typically starts, you know, beginning of May and goes through probably the beginning of of October. So that's about a five month stretch. But throughout that process, um, during the summer, while we're putting on shows in Atlanta, I'm planning for the spring in other cities. Um, in the fall, when we get done with um, shows that are that we're doing at Mabel House. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to book and, and, and plan for shows for the next summer. So it's it's a constant uh, business that you just, you know, if you want to be successful at it, there, there, there really isn't a off time. Unless you have a COVID-19 pandemic. Right. 
<laughs> so, um, so have you been able to do anything during this this downtime um, when all the millions of concert venues have been closed? Um, have you been able to do any other uh, virtual or drive in anywhere? Um, I'm I'm involved with some virtual stuff right now um, that uh, we filmed um, about. Uh, we filmed a while ago that that's going to be airing starting October the 9th. Um, it's an old school hip hop party with with Mike Epps and a couple of the old school hip hop artists. Um, but in terms of doing drive ins um, and that type of thing, I just decided not to not to do that um, again in terms of business. I just didn't see the the. Uh, the risk being or the reward being worth the risk in, in, in with doing the driving. Okay. Bridget, do you have any questions for Jeremy? Um, I asked post in the chat. Uh, good morning, everyone. You can oh, feel free to post in the chat if you have any questions for Jeremy. Uh, I do want to comment on that. That's good that, you know, in the industry, a lot of people have pivoted to different types of programming, like virtual, like um, some drive-in events. You know, that we as a venue try to pivot and do a little bit of drive-in concerts, but our drive-in movie series in a concert. But, you know, some of the figures on that, like, you know, we have a, a LED screen that costs what about what ninety thousand dollars. <laughs> and you know, and and that's to your point. You were saying people don't necessarily understand the business of things sometimes. So we did get feedback about, oh, the screen is so small, and y'all should buy another screen. And we're like, ah, another ninety thousand dollars screen. <laughs> yeah. For you know, and we have because we have to accommodate social distancing. You know, the 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 profit from tickets are not gonna. You know, at least how we're selling the tickets unless we did it you know fifty dollars per person we're doing fifty dollars per car but i've seen some of those parking lot concerts being fifty dollars per person in the car and then the vip section being 150 dollars. but you still have to pay for the fifty dollars per car um to even get it so i think they had a rick ross parking lot concert and that was sixty dollars per person in the car and then the vip option of 150 dollars. <laughs> so um i don't think people think about those things and you know we're, we're, we're trying, you know, to pivot a little bit, but I think that was a good point that you made that sometimes we have to be strategic and intentional about the type of programming that we're offering because it does, that means new equipment, that means new policies and procedures to think of, which means more money, you know, oftentimes. Um, I didn't really see any uh, questions in there. Uh, there's no questions right now. Um, we have a few attendees though. Hi guys. Yeah, we do. Hello. Uh, so Jeremy, what has been your most memorable concert that you promoted? Wow. Probably the very first one, um, Robbie. Uh, <laughs> probably the very first one. You know, for me, is 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 really business and um, you know, very seldom do I actually get the opportunity to really enjoy a show. Um, I think people, people, are, you know, think that because I'm a concert promoter and I'm constantly at shows and that type of thing that I'm just having all this great fun. Um, <laughs> but they don't understand, you know, a lot of times uh, logistically things can go wrong. Technical issues can happen. Um, you know, I'm never satisfied until the concert is over um, because just things go wrong all the time. You know, we we have a very tight curfew at, at Maywell's uh, that, you know, we can't go over. So people think sometimes that, man, they just ended the show. Well, yeah, we ended the show because we have a curfew. Right? Um, there's just there's just a lot of things that the general public does doesn't understand um, that, you know, we have to constantly be vigilant of and and at the end of the day um even if there wasn't a curfew you know when you have shows that go on and you have employees working uh at the at the different venues etc then you know things can go can go over time which costs thousands of dollars i'll never forget i did a show at uh at now state farm arena it was phil's arena then that went into overtime um 
and Phillips Arena at the time, they charged you $9,000 for every 30 minutes you go over. So it didn't matter if we went over one minute or 30 minutes, that was an additional $9,000. Um, and again, you know, so no, I don't have fun at the concert. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, what's the, uh, what is the most memorable concert that you attended while growing up that kind of got you, that you can remember that like you were like really, uh, not even in the business yet, and you were like, this is really cool. I really like this concert. So first of all, you got to understand where I grew up at. I'm a country boy, right? So mm. I, grew up in, I grew up in Milledgeville, Georgia. And uh, so obviously there are no concerts coming to Milledgeville, Georgia. Um, but where, where shows used to come that we would go to in the central Georgia area was uh, was uh, Macon, Georgia. Mm. And um, so I attended a, a concert one time. I think it was um, it was uh, it was with my mom and dad. It was with uh, I think it was Luther Vandross, um, Karen White, and I think the group Levert was together at the time. Um, but I remember that show um, very well. Probably the very first show that I went to, and um, then a, then a, another memorable show that I had. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my, my, my dad's favorite group was Maze featuring Frankie Beverly. And they had a um they had a two-day music festival. It was like a Labor Day weekend out at uh the old Turner Field um parking lot. And I attended that show. And I, that was actually the last show I was a, I, I ever attended with my father before he passed. Um, but just to see him being super happy. And enjoying himself on that day was a uh, was also a memorable memorable show that I, I've attended. Well, we still don't have any questions and uh, from our attendees, but um, unless Bridget has some more questions, I I'm out of kind of questions. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, to the to those attending, I know this this recording will be on YouTube for people to view later, and there may be some people who have additional questions uh, later on. Um, just to kind of sum everything up, since we have four minutes, you know, we had our first Thursday 30 and we talked to director Jimmy Giese, who's the parts director, who kind of gave us a history and talking about how the Mabel House is a rental facility. Um, and that kind of was something that started in 2009. So people may be familiar with the Wait For It concerts, uh, some of the South Cobb Arts Alliance uh, candlelight concerts. And Jeremy has brought a lot of our concerts here. And to Director Giese's point, he just talked about, Jeremy, you being here at the, the amphitheater has really, for the first time in the history of the amphitheater, we've gone black in terms of just like our expenses to uh, budgeting. So we just thank you for being here with us and, you know, having being a partner with us and we're looking forward to, you know, trying to do something in 2021. I think, of course, a lot of questions we get as a venue is, you know, would you be interested in doing other genres outside of the urban market? Um, and so what are your thoughts on that? Or have you had experience doing, you know, some other genres and like how that experience been? Um, you know, as a, as a, as a businessman or working with people in uh, in variety of genres. Yeah, so um, I've done some small stuff with other genres, but the you know dealing with artists and and agents and other genres is extremely extremely uh, difficult to kind of crack into those into those relationships. Sometimes uh, I wouldn't say sometimes; I'll say all the time. Um, so would I love to do it? Absolutely. Um, but it is, a, it is a super hard um, for one. And then, and then for two, um, you know, again, business just has to make sense. Um, a lot of artists in other genres are, are, are super expensive, and especially the ones that sell tickets. And so sometimes, you know, from a financial standpoint, it's just it's really hard to make it make sense. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to um, bring uh, more genres out there. Um, and, and I'm working on doing that, you know, um, um, you know, getting more sponsors and stuff like that kind of helps offset costs and that type of thing. One of the things I was really looking forward to in 2020 was working with uh, Mr. Steve Ewing and Wade Ford kind of teaming up with me 
Um, so we, you know, we, we were doing some stuff that I think made sense, you know, for the both of us. And um, um, so I was super excited about, you know, the opportunity to collaborate, collaborate with him and, um, and really do some exciting things out there. Well, I think we're getting towards the end of our Thursday 30. Jeremy, thank you for coming online with us and, and chatting for a little bit. And uh, Bridget, I'm gonna let you introduce our next Thursday 30, which will be next week, uh, since you will be presenting, you'll be hosting that one. Yeah, so um, next week, Thursday 30, that is October 8th, um, we'll be having Calundra Smith. Uh, she is an arts, uh, theater arts critic, probably one of the um, only black women arts theater arts critic in the nation. Uh, she has articles in the Atlanta Journal Constitution Arts ATL. Um, so she writes a lot about, you know, theater, uh, American theater. She's also part of the American Theater Critics Association. So we'll just kind of be asking about theater criticism. You know, how does she do reviews? How does she get into it? Uh, She's a, a, a friend of mine. Of course, we went to the University of Georgia together, and then she attended Syracuse for her master's. And um, I'm, uh, well, she got a master's of arts. I'm not exactly sure the exact, all of those things, but her bio will be releasing pretty soon. Um, so, of course, join us next week uh, to hear from Calendra Smith. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And I love hearing about all the things that she gets an opportunity to do in real life. And, you know, I have really awesome friends. So, yeah. Well, that sounds very exciting, and I look forward to the next Thursday 30. We'll be releasing that link on Tuesday. So uh, please look on our social media, and we will see you guys next week. Thank you again, Jeremy. Thanks a lot, guys.